Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 Purina version of the virtual farm tour. My name is Alan Johnson. I'm a dairy consultant for Purina Animal Nutrition in Northeast Ohio, and today it's my pleasure to introduce you to Kurt and Robin Steiner of Steinhurst Dairy. Before I bring Kurt up, I'll give you a little bit of background on their operation. Throughout uh, seven generations, the Steiners have seen their fair share of, of change in the dairy industry, as I'm sure many of you have. Kurt's philosophy is, he's, Kurt's got many philosophies, but his philosophy is, has always been uh, how, you, how you handle this change will determine your, your outcome. One of the, the family's top priorities is not only to run a profitable business, but probably more importantly to maintain and improve an operation that, that the next generation would be, be proud to take over. Um, at Steinhurst Dairy, they're good at a lot of things, but, but one thing that they have done over the years is, is they've made a team approach to decision making, okay? The original team consisted of the, all of the partners of the dairy, obviously, along with the veterinarian and myself. Um, Kurt would let production numbers and trends brought to him by this team dictate his direction. In the last few years, Kurt has taken this to the next level. Uh, he's expanded his team of experts to include a financial consultant as well as some risk management advisors. Um, this approach has given Kurt a true cost of production on his dairy, which allows him to make faster adjustments to his operation as well as, as more educated risk management decisions for the future. Lastly, succession planning has proven to be very critical to Steinhurst Dairy, and Kurt will elaborate on that a little bit as he talks. The Steiners milk 650 cows three times a day. They have a rolling herd average of 30,595 pounds of milk with a 3.9 fat test and a 3.0 protein. They farm 1,100 acres of ground in Creston, Ohio, and uh, provide all of the forage and the majority of the corn for their dairy. Their forage consists of corn silage, alfalfa, and rye silage. And they also work uh, with custom harvesters to do all the, the custom harvesting of the haylage and the corn silage. Um, Kurt and Robin and the Steiners have a rich family history and have weathered many storms. I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with them for the past 20 years and I consider the team at Steinhurst to be among the very best in the dairy business. But probably more importantly, I consider them close friends. So with that, I'm going to start a video before I bring Kurt up, and then I'll let Kurt take over from there. Steinhurst Dairy uh, consists of about 550 milking cows. We have another 550 head of heifers, and I'm very proud of the product that we send down the road. I still enjoy getting up in the morning and, and going out and spending a lot of time with the cows. I've been an owner in this operation since I was 30. Every day when I wake up, I have that burden of I have debt to repay, I have a job I have to do, and I have a family to take care of. One philosophy that we have is a healthy cow will give a lot of milk. We want to be able to take advantage of the genetic potential that these cows have. And our nutritionist does it all the time. Alan is one of these guys that is just part of our team. He's become family. When things are going good, we celebrate our successes. When things are going bad, I don't run him out the door. We grow from it. I don't want my children to take over something that they're not proud of. This building project we're doing right now consisted of tearing down some facilities that were built in 1970 and we tore down two and a half barns, a silo, and tore up a lot of concrete. It was poured by my father. To get old facilities out and to put in new facilities gives them hope and gives them something that they can work for. When my father passed away, uh, we didn't miss a beat as far as keeping this thing moving forward. It can happen so suddenly, it can happen so quick, and that's what we found out. Dad was here Sunday morning and he was gone Sunday afternoon. So now it's just my brother Eric and I and uh, my Uncle John. Our biggest thing with the next generation is understanding that if you're willing to start at the bottom and work your way up, then you'll be very valuable in an operation. And you'll also be a great manager. 
Our family had been here since uh, 1820. I would like to see uh, the next generation succeed and I'd like to contribute and do my part to uh, add to a successful operation. As Uncle John's got a little bit older, Eric and I have had to step up and, and make some of these decisions and you know it's our turn and hopefully someday there'll be another generation I want to make them. For as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to come back to the farm, stay here in Wayne County, and just pretty much do the same thing Dad did. You look all the way across the horizon like, this is mine. You see the animals when they're born, raised all the way up. You see God's creation every day. You work outside, you work with your family. It shows you, it kind of like builds a little bit more connection with them, that it's kind of easier. You work with them 24 seven. If I've do become the manager one day that maybe I'll have the opportunity to bring my kids out to the farm and to get the same chances that I would have when I was younger. You know, we're survivors in a tough industry. And if you can survive and you can move on to the next generation, it's like, I did my job. I got it to the next, to the next group of guys. But ultimately, the number one way we can know if we're successful is are we paying our bills, are we meeting our debts? And what is our quality of life like? And as long as those are being met, then I feel like we're, we're doing just fine. So welcome to this talk that they've asked me to give today. I told a group of guys earlier, you know, you're hesitant to do these kind of things because you just don't feel like you're... Um, quite as good as the next guy. I look out in the far out in the room and I just have so much respect for all the dairymen are here. You walk around the World Dairy Expo and you see our infrastructure, what's going on out there and there's just so many qualified people. But you know in our local area, we're, I'm from Wayne County, Ohio and um, you got it? In Wayne County there's a still we, we still have a good dairy sector. We still have a good um, infrastructure. And they have these different tours every now and then. They'll have what they call the fall foliage tour. It's a tour of just general agriculture. And they always try to get one or two dairies on it. And so, and so uh, I've been able to stay off that, not having to host that thing. And then they have this summer tour that's really gotten to be a big thing. Uh, they, they call it the summer twilight tour. And they might have, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 people show up to this thing. And that thing's getting very popular. And so I have, uh, I don't really want to host that. And so I said, well, maybe if to make myself feel better, I'll come up here to the World Dairy Expo and I'll give a little talk up here and I can tell my friends I, I did my part. And because I know it's nice to sit in the crowd and hear guys willing to speak, but uh, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. So I wanted to uh, uh, welcome everybody here to, our, uh, to my talk. We are located in Creston, Ohio. We're, our farm where we're located today was established in 1959. Our, our family goes back in Milton Township, our township at home, clear back to the 1820s. So I am the seventh generation farmer in our township. My son would be the eighth. We milk 650 cows now. This video was put together a couple years ago. We have nine employees, and we do milk um, or do farm 1,100 acres. And I just wanted to give credit to the guys on the team uh, since my Father passed away in 2009. I farmed with Uncle John on the left and my brother Eric there in the middle, myself since then. And uh, we have a great relationship. And I think that uh, things that we've done at home to try to maintain that great relationship has been really important for what, for what we're doing. I put this slide up here because I want to, sh you're saying why in the world would a guy start with a bunch of calf hutches for a speech? I worked off the farm, I went to Ohio State and I worked off the farm for seven years. And I came back to the farm, and one of the things that, and I see in, our, in the crowd today, there's some younger guys and there's some older guys. The younger guys think they know everything, and the old guys think they know everything. And I was told when I came back to the farm, Kurt, you got to keep your mouth shut for a couple years. Years. And I thought, that's kind of odd, but I, I did. I kept my mouth shut. I took a lot of notes. I had an old veterinarian in Creston, Chuck Jamison, was a good guy, a real mentor to me. He said, Kurt, just take your time, but take notes. And one of the things that really bothered me for a year and a half is my dad busted his butt every day feeding calves. 
When I was young, my Uncle John that I showed you in the picture, John was about seven, eight years younger than my dad. He was like a fun uncle. You ever have a fun uncle, a guy that you really enjoyed being around? So he milked the cows, so my brothers and I would run out to help him milk. My dad fed calves. As we all got older and we took over the milking responsibilities, dad kept feeding calves. My brother and I, when I came back in 1994, our main job right then, we had milking 140 cows, was to milk, we milked the cows, dad fed the calves. So for 50 years, my dad fed calves. He fed calves the morning, the morning of his passing. And in those 50 years, the first bunch of years, he fed calves in a bank barn with a whole bunch of calves run together with no ventilation. And I kept track, and we had about a 30% death loss. And I finally convinced, we convinced my dad to move outside to the hutches. You know, there's an old saying, no calves have died that were raised outside. Or no, many calves have died that were not raised outside, but nobody's ever died feeding calves outside. And my dad, when we moved to the hutches, my dad raised a hundred and some calves in a row before he lost his first one. And it was amazing. And that was the first thing that I brought back to the dairy where they started to listen to us a little bit. Now, another story I want to say about my dad real quick was my dad stuttered real bad. But I could slow my dad down and I could put my hand on his shoulder and get him to slow down a little bit and say what he was going to say. And one morning, and this is not an advertisement for Perina, but one morning he came into the parlor and he was really stuttering. And I got it out of him. We had started that cows match program and one of those calves literally leaped over top one of those hog panels. It was so healthy. <laughs> and that told me that day. Not only did my dad raise calves in a bank barn for a bunch of years, I think that was the first time he ever truly saw a healthy calf. I mean it after all those years. We saw the genetic potential and the, and the beauty of a healthy calf. Now one other thing we did to get, our, to get uh, started and how we came back to the dairy was my brother and I went to a meeting one time that Bill Bickert talked about. Bickert was the guy at Michigan State University who did buildings. And I'll never forget what he told us. He says, how do you guys plan on farming around here with all these barns all cooped up? And uh, he says, you've got to open these barns up. And this has been a couple years after I was back on a farm. And that afternoon, my brother and I went home, and we cut the sides off the dairy barn with a skill saw. And my uncle and John came home, and that's what they found, was the sides off the old, old dairy barn. We have since tore it down, or I'd show you pictures. So I'm not telling you young guys to go home and tear the sides off the dairy barn. You might be out the door today's day and age, but I'm here to tell you, somehow you got to get across, you're going to make some changes. And, and that was what, how we did it. Now, we built this barn, you know, in 1994, 95, I came back to the dairy, and we built just a common dairy barn in 95. And 2002, we added on to it. We had an old parallel, or an old herringbone parlor we were milking in. And this is in 1998, and our dairy, one thing I want to tell you about our dairy, we're proud of our dairy, but our dairy is, is it's, not, it's not all add-ons and attachments and all that kind of thing, but we do try to, to do, um, make good decisions and, and spend money where money needs to be spent. We had an old hair, uh, herringbone parlor. I was ready to go out and build a brand new parlor. We had went and looked at a lot of facilities. And then a guy walked in one day and he says, why don't you just convert your herringbone parlor double six into a double ten parallel? And we did it. And uh, we have milked a lot of cows in that parlor. We're milking almost 20 hours a day right now, three times a day. And the guys that are in milk, this thing has really held up for us. We've made a few adjustments to the vacuum and that kind of thing, pulsation and takeoffs and things like that. But we've done well. And Eric and I, my brother, have talked different times about you know, is it time now? I'm 56, he's 52. Is it time to go out and, and build something different? Or do you, do you wait for the kids to come back if they're going to come back and then build it? That's one of our questions. We'll get to that in a little bit. So we, we don't have a super fancy facade on the front of our parlor, and we don't have our name anywhere and things like that. But we do have a, a nice little setup, and um, we had a little fake brick on the front when we expanded the milk house to make it look nice. And we try to do things to keep our place looking nice around there. You know, I just do believe that there's a guy down in our area who owns a wood company called P. Graham Dunn, and I was reading his book the other day, and he said, you know, there's just something about a clean facility. Now, I got a neighbor whose place is so clean, I couldn't possibly keep it that clean. But we try hard to keep our place clean and, and, and keep the, ad the atmosphere nice around there. So in, in uh, 2009, we built this new dairy barn. It was, a, it was uh, added... Uh, 
300 and some stalls. And so now we have, our dairy consists of 650 milking cows and we have about, well, because we live in Ohio and 700 is the maximum, you shouldn't be over until you get a permit. We have, uh, see if we have 650 milking cows, we have 49 dry cows, I guess, and then we're 699 cows at the dairy. And one of the things that we really try hard to do is cow comfort, it's all about cow comfort at our place. And you know, I have had people come through our dairy at different times. I tell them I wouldn't be afraid to sleep in the first freestall in this barn for about 10 months out of the year. It's a good environment up there. The cows are laying on sand, it's cool. Um, the fans are blowing all the time. We got misters and sprinklers. We really try hard to take care of our cows. And I just believe that, you know, the healthier we are taking care of cows, the the cows are the better off we're going to do. Now I'll tell you a little story. This uh, we've had groups come out to our farm already and things. And I had a group out there one time. It's probably been seven, eight years ago. And I had a group came out, and I could tell it was a group out of Worcester. In fact, the dog warden was with them. Somehow this group included the dog warden, and I kid you not, the dog warden took a look at our family dog and it didn't have tags, and they threatened to give me a fine right there on the spot. I said, you gotta be kidding me. So I invited you to my dairy, and just because my dog doesn't have a tag. So we had a little discussion about that. But uh, anyway, a guy in there, our dry cows were in, had the ability to go out to pasture. But on this particular day, they were all inside. And they got to asking me, how come your cows aren't out on pasture? And, and, and this conversation started to, you know how they start out. They start out kind of nice, and then they start pushing a little bit. You know, are you, are you against your cows being out in the pasture? I said, no, I'm not. A, and so I said, let me show you something. So I went out to this dry cow barn, and we pushed all the cows out into the pasture. I knew exactly what was going to happen. It was about 95 degrees out that day. And they went out there in the pasture and we walked back around into this barn. It was cool in there and everything. And I was giving a little talk at the end of this barn. And I was watching those dry cows go back in that barn. And I asked the guy, I got, grabbed him when I got done talking. I said, hey, did you see where those cows went? And he said, they went back in the barn. And I said, uh, talked to him about a little bit, the value of that. And then I said, um, hey, where's your dog at today? And he goes, how do you know I got a dog? I said, everybody has a dog. I said, where's your dog at today? He said, I locked him on my back porch. I said, why'd you lock him on the back porch? He said, it was, it's hot outside. I said, see, that's exactly the same thing we got going in our industry. We may not have massive big fields for our cows to be in, but we take care of them. And I've seen cows already. When we built this barn in 1990, or excuse me, in 2009, I had a crazy thing happen the first morning I put the cows in the barn. I was walking up to the barn to bring them down to Malcolm, and we had waters right inside the first gate. There was a water, and we have a massive concrete structure behind the water. I couldn't see through, and there wasn't a cow in the barn. You know where they were? They were all laying down. And that's the first time I had ever seen that in my life. The other barn's a sawdust barn with mattresses, and every time I'd go get cows to get them, there'd be some mingling around. I went up to that sand barn that first morning. I took a picture. I don't have it anymore. I looked over that concrete, and I thought they were gone. I mean, literally gone. And, and the concrete was about this high, and I crawled over and looked, and every cow was laying in a stall. And that's when I knew we had made the right decision, and it was a good thing for cow comfort. We don't have sand lanes and things like that. In fact, today I told my boy, well, yesterday when I left, I told my boy, get that crew rounded up, and when I come home, I'm hoping that sand pit's hauled out. I know it's a little bit... You know, we'd like to reuse our sand. A lot of guys in our area do, but we've chosen not to. Sand's not that expensive, and uh, it's a simple way of doing it, and it works really fine for us to help us get to the numbers that Alan talked about. Now, I, you heard that thing about Bickert said about tear barns down, and I never forgot that. My dad and my uncle in 1970 moved to our dairy, and they moved to the dairy in 1959. In 1970, they built kind of added on to some barns. They built a lot of concrete. They, they built a freestall barn. They uh, decided that they were going to have a, we had an outside feeding area that we converted into. A lot of cows were fed outside. And my brother and I decided we were going to tear it all out of there and start over. And 
Talked to my Uncle John about it. And he was, he agreed it's probably the thing to do, but it's kind of hard to rip out everything your dad did. Mm -hmm. But we ripped it all out, and we put in this dry cow barn. And I'll tell you what, um, dry cow, dry cow care. Mm -hmm. The only place we spend time on our dairy with our cows is in the dry cow barn mm -hmm. and the post fresh barn, and that's basically it. The only time we go up to the high producing barns is when we have vet check. Mm -hmm. um, we might walk through the barn, of course, to do a little bit of synchronized breeding and things like that. But right here is where we've done, since we built this barn in 2017, our numbers have just went out of this world. It's about dry cow care. It's about moving your cows to the right place at the right time. It's about making sure 24 days before they fresh, they're in the pre-fresh where they need to be. It's about making sure your heifers are 30 to 35 days, 40 days even into the pre-fresh. And I tell you, our problems, if when we have problems, we can go right back to how our dry cow care was. You know, I said, we, we do what's called uh, just on time calving. We have one pen for calving cows. I was at a meeting one time and a young guy, we were supposed to all talk about what was the next facility we were gonna build. And this young guy was talking about building a facility that had, he was all proud, he had all the plans and everything. He said, I'm gonna build a facility for uh, fresh cows. And he said, I'm gonna have six pens to put my dry cows in before they have calves so nobody calves in the manure. And I'm looking at this thing, and this is against everything Alan's ever taught me about taking care of a dry cow. And I was looking around, and everybody's taking this in. There's about 12 of us in the group. And I don't know how many of you guys know uh, Lambert out there, Lambert Vandermaid in Western Ohio, but old Lambert, he'll say what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. And I looked at Lambert, and Lambert looked at me, and I said, are you going to tell him or am I? We kind of, through our eyes, is how we communicated it. Mm -hmm. Finally, finally, Lambert says, hey, I'd like to talk about those plans a little bit. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. And we started talking about it. And we saw that guy a year later and he said, I decided not to build that barn. I built one like you guys talked about. The less time we spend moving our dry cows, the better off our dry cows do. If I was gonna freshen a cow, I'd love to find her with the feet out and I move her right away to the calving pen and she calves and she goes right to our post fresh. And our problems are so limited. They don't have diet changes. They don't have environmental changes. They don't have water changes. There are no changes. The only change they have is going from being a dry cow to a fresh cow. And we have one calving pen for all our cows. It gets a little bit crowded every now and then during the week or during the day maybe if four or five of them decide they're going to calve. Always on Saturday night and Sunday morning. But um, that's how we do it. And I think that's one of the things that we've really done right on our dairy. Now, after we build these barns and everything, and our dairy started to get bigger, we went from 140 cows to, and this is more about the talk that I'd really like to give. You know, of course, in today's day and age, it's impossible to find workers. I know you, everybody's got the same problem. I don't care what industry you're in. We drove up here. I couldn't believe all the signs. I mean, the way people were advertising trying to get workers is amazing. And I've always been one of these guys that, that believes that people have got talent. You just have to find out what their talent is. It's no secret in the dairy industry, Hispanics are a big part of what we do. This young boy doesn't work for me anymore because he had a family member out in Oregon that he had to go out and be with for some other reasons, and so he's not here anymore. But I tell you, when this young guy showed up, one day I was checking the fresh cows, and I was walking down through there with some keto sticks, and he said, hey, boss, you checking pH? He had only been up here from Guatemala for a short time. I know I'm checking for ketosis, and he walked on. And then he come back a little bit later and he said, uh, he said, what do you do with the colostrum? He asked me, what do you do with the colostrum? Well, here's a guy talking about pH sticks and colostrum from Guatemala. This, guy's got, this guy knows something. How does he know this? And so I got to talking to him through an interpreter. I got my interpreter on, one of the guys who works there. Uh, uh, Roger didn't speak that good of English yet. Come to find out, he spent three years in Guatemala at an agriculture college. Every six months, they did a little different thing on a different species. So for six months, he was doing chickens. For six months, he was doing dairy. For six months, he was an equine. Here, this guy, he's got some talent. And so we quickly didn't take long to foster him and get him moving into some other roles on the dairy. So we gave him a lot more responsibility. I've got a guy who came up there when I first met him. I didn't know if he had any talent. But he's got a little bit of welding talent and a little bit of mechanical talent. He worked in Guatemala on a crew 
that had a lot of trucks, and he kind of was the, was the uh, mechanic. Now, I'm not going to say he could do what we do at Ray's Garage or the local dealership, but he can sure do enough to get me by. And I found out that he does a really good job. I don't like to micromanage people. I've got, you know, this calling the guys all the time and asking them what they're doing, I can't stand that. If you drop all the way down to the bottom, down, down here um, further where it says think before you react, you know, there's people that I know in the industry that if one of these, uh, one of these Hispanics or one of these workers hits a gate with a skid steer, they go crazy. But we got skid steer blight at our place. Do you guys have that at your place? You know, it happens. But I'm going to tell you something. Do you ever try to drive a skid steer on a six-hour shift all day long? I get on a skid steer, and it isn't about 20 minutes to I realize it would be best if I was off the skid steer. <laughs> And that's 20 minutes, and these guys are doing it every day. I can't believe the hours on these skid steers because we scrape so much. And, and these guys, you know, you can't fly off the handle every time something like this happens. You're not going to have a work crew. And these guys got to be feel comfortable enough with you that they'll come back to you and tell you when they've done something wrong. The other day, one of the guys got a hold of me. Boss, I got a big problem. Okay, big problem. What's a big problem? Hey, boss, he said, I break something on the gate. I put it on top of the uh, desk. He said, I want you to know it's there. Well, nothing makes me matter to have, if you have the kind of a personality that they can't come to you when they made a mistake. He's calling me to tell me, hey, I knocked the hinge off the gate. It's on your desk. I did it. Will you please fix it for me? That's all he's asking. Alessandro's a tremendous worker on our dairy. And, and, and I think we have that kind of a relationship, my brother and I, back and forth that we can, ha we can talk about and just do those kind of things. We hold meetings with the guys. We blow through pizza like you've never blown through pizza at our place. But I tell you what, they like pizza. Chicken pepperoni, or excuse me, chicken pineapple. And they'll eat a lot of it. And uh, they, they enjoy that. And so we try to do, we try to keep it positive. I like to go watch, when I talk about managing my people, you know, our guys like to play soccer. We got, they built a little volleyball net down there at their house where, I, where they stay at one of our houses. They've got this homemade volleyball net, but it's kind of neat. They'll go down there and play. They play in this soccer league, and I like to go watch them play soccer. They play in Sterling on Thursday nights. I think half the dairy in the area is kids or guys are over there at 6 o'clock. If you wonder where they're at, man, at 6 o'clock, they're in Sterling playing soccer. There are a whole bunch of them, but they like to have fun, and they like if you show up. They like if you watch them and make them part of your family life. So I've tried to do a lot of things. I know a lot of you do. Bottom line is I try to trust them. And I try to give them the impact. And we don't have a lot of turnover. We have guys who've been there for 10 years and 8 years and 5 years. But we do have a couple on the bottom end move on. But we try hard not to let that happen. I was, was, and I just wanted to throw, told Julian I was going to put his picture up there. That's the old guy in there. I said, Julian, I'm going to put you in the talk. So there he's up there. Um, you know, and then Alan talked about this team approach. And I, you know, the older generation tends to not like to share numbers and things like that with other people. Um, you know, Johnson's been with me for 20 years. I, he knows more about me probably than, than a lot of people. And so I'm not afraid to share numbers with, with my team. And my team used to consist of Alan and, and uh, our veterinarian, Gabe in the back there. And we would talk about things. and and. Um, we really don't make major decisions without running a buyer team because they, they're out there and they see a lot of what's going on. Now, I'm one of these guys, I don't have to have my nutritionist coming to me every Friday morning and tell me about the neighbor. I, I don't need to know about the neighbor. In fact, farming would be a heck of a lot easier if you didn't have neighbors, wouldn't it? You know, if you didn't have to watch a neighbor going down the road all the time and all you could do is farm, you'd be all right. But my problem is I see old Jimmy Winkler's guys flying down 504 getting something done, but I'm spinning my wheels, and it gets hard. So I don't ask him a lot of questions about what's going on. But they do have expertise, and they've, been, they've seen a lot of things. And so you come up with some cockamamie idea that you're going to do, and he says, hey, wait a minute, I've seen that, and it don't work. Listen. I listen to that kind of stuff, and so I think that's positive. So... When we, have, we started out with this team thing, you know that I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about my father passing away um, and the importance of succession planning. That's kind of why I've been asked to speak. But we talked about in this team thing, what do we do well? You know, what, what, is our, what, do we, what is our strengths and what are our weaknesses on the dairy? And our strengths are we're, we're cow guys. 
My brother and I and my son, Christian, we like cows. What do I not good at? Well, I don't have grease under my fingernails, I'll tell you that. I'm not very good. No, my, you know, when, when my dad and uncle, I was the oldest of five boys, when we were farming and, ba and uh, baling hay or chopping and we had to work on gravity wagons, chains and all that kind of stuff, we'd drag these pieces to the shop and my dad and uncle would say, hey, you go do something else, we'll fix it. Well, I took that to heart, I can't fix anything. And so, um, I'm not ashamed to admit it, that's not my strength. My strength is taking care of cows. What are some other weaknesses we have? Well, because we're not equipment guys, maybe it's in our best interest not to have a lot of equipment. And as we sat down and looked at numbers and things, I see a lot of my friends are trying to do it all with big equipment. I don't own a Fent tractor and all these other things. Some guys do, and that's fine. But I know one thing, this last week when the custom harvester pulled in with seven guys, I didn't have to find any of them. I can't find guys now to do anything. So these custom harvest guys roll in and they whip out, you know, 400 acres and 9,000 tons or whatever it was and they left. I sure didn't do anything in the shop. We did have to pump up a tire, but that was about it. And the chopper broke one day and I went on with what I'm doing. Another strength of mine is I think I'm a pretty good dad. And I, say, I don't say that lightly. I'm not in this business to kill myself. I'm not in this business to work 18 hours a day. I'm in this business, well, I'm on this earth to get to heaven. That's what I'm really on here for. And I'm going to try to lead that lifestyle. And if we have to work 14, 15 hours a day to get our work done, I, that's not for me. That's not my strength. My strength is getting out of bed in the morning, putting in a solid day, and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we like to be done. Now, was I pushing feed at 7.30, 8 o'clock the other night? You bet I was. Do I have to plant corn in the dark? Sometimes, but not often. But, so my strength is, is trying to be a family man, trying to be a good cow man, trying to be a good example, trying to be a good leader in my community, in my church. And I want time to do that kind of stuff. So we, when I came back to the dairy and we started working with my family, we soon went on to three time a day milking. Why? Because all the activities happened between five o'clock and eight o'clock at night and that's when we weren't milking cows. We milked at four and noon and eight at night. So sometimes we had to milk the night shift. But you know what? From five to eight, I could be with my family. We come from a very faith-based area. Dinner's important. Well, you can tell by looking at me, dinner's important. <laughs> but dinner's important. Family time's important. Sitting around the table's important. We try hard to get there. And I think we were pretty successful. But we had to work some late at night till we got our dairy up big enough till the workers could help do it. So those were our strengths. And then our weaknesses, of course, like I said, was equipment. And as we've, the dairy's gotten bigger, we, we got out of the manure handling business too. We have somebody come in and do it for us. And there's no better feeling. Well, the other day, I'll tell you a story. We, uh, I was, uh, we were hauling sand out of this dry cow barn we built. And uh, I told the guys that I had to meet with my sister-in-law for something here. And uh, I... Uh, told him, I said, I'm going to quit at 6 o'clock, and that crew of guys, they, uh, I came out at 3.30 in the morning to feed, start feeding, and uh, I noticed the pit was empty. I couldn't believe it. Here they had rounded up a couple guys and said, we're going to knock it out. It's going to rain. It never did rain, but they had to work done, and I'm thankful. So a high-producing cow will help pay a lot of bills, and custom harvesting and fall manure, all manure, are two areas that we've really cut out. How are we doing on time, Alan? Okay. So after we built this team up and everything, and we, we, we worked with this team, then, then we got into this thing about what, it, what is truly your cost of production. We wanted to do some things on the dairy that were, were um, I don't know, we were just trying to figure out we were, where we were at. And I decided that we were going to get a, um, a guy came into the area, financial planner, Deem, um, Deem Associates, and they've really helped me out a lot. If you want to see later, I can show you some graphs and things that they did for us, but we really didn't have a clue what our budget was. We didn't have a clue what our cost of production was. We had no clue about any of that. We th you have it in your head, and you, you just know at the end of the month if there's money or not. But, you know, how are you doing year long on your budget and how, you know, your repair expense and your parlor expense and all this stuff. And so we really sat down and pounded out a lot of numbers for the last four years. 
and it has really been a big asset to our dairy. We just deci we decided that um, we probably couldn't probably couldn't move ahead like we have been able to do without this type of without this type of information. Um, we do a great job managing the people, and we've reduced our employee turnover. But I'm proud of numbers that came out of these things we found out. We found out when we benchmark against other herds that we have some crazy thing like uh, more pounds of milk going for the number of employees than, than he has in his uh, whole portfolio. Um, so we're doing some things right there. And I don't feel like we're really burning the employees out. They like the hours they're getting. So for that, we've been very successful. Um, our repair costs were high. And, and as we started to get out of this equipment business, and really we had a couple of things we really gave up recently that have helped a lot, and, and especially in the manure thing. And, and it just seems like we, we've been able to um, have more money in the account. And in tough times, that's about what it's all about, and that's where we're at. So if you know your cost of production, and you know where you're at in your cost of production, then what's the only other thing you have to know? What's going to be your price of milk? And we've worked with Alan through Land of Lakes, and we've been able to work through that insurance program, and we've been able to basically protect ourselves on the bottom end in our milk price. And it's like an insurance premium, and I've got to pay insurance premium costs, but in the last two and a half years since we've been doing it, we've got checks back two times, two different times. I don't know what the numbers are exactly, how much behind we are because of the insurance, but I know one thing, I'm sleeping a whole lot better. Because I know that where I'm at, I'm going to at least be making money. I don't have to make a lot, but I just need to be profitable. And through this program that Land O'Lakes has, it's been, it's been very good for us. Their CAP program and the feed side of things is really a good program for us. You know, when the price of feed goes down, we get the downs. You have to pay a little bit of a, maybe a $10 a ton CAP. But when the price of feed goes up, you're protected. So the more I can be protected and the more I know where I'm at, the better off I think I am. So we, in 2009, um, as a family, we were cruising along and it couldn't have been better for us. Our children were young, my daughter was coming out of high school, things were going really good for us. And uh, Sunday the Super Bowl on February 1st, 2009, Dad was out in the barn and we had a great morning together. I remember that it wasn't uh, anything extra special except that when he left, Gave him a thumbs up and he went down to drive. And that's the last time I saw my dad alive. My dad had a heart attack that night. Um, right before the Super Bowl, a lot of people in here were family or friends, know, knew my dad, know exactly where they were when his uh, passing happened. He was a good, good man. He, um, my dad was one of these guys that was more of a, on a dairy farm. He didn't like anything to do with the business side of things. He just liked to work. And he just enjoyed seeing, enjoyed seeing his boys take it over. And he didn't cause friction for that next generation. He wanted it to work. Um, and so as we came back, my brother Eric and I, as we were on the dairy, uh, we would talk to my dad and uncle. They were very receptive to a lot of the things we wanted to do. I said earlier, you young guys, you have ideas, and the old guys have ideas. Somewhere this has to mesh. I just can't, I don't get it when the older generation has younger kids that want a farm and can't give that up. Um, there is no better joy to me, except for my personal life with my Lord, that, and my wife, because she's sitting here, <laughs> that I have than when I can see my son come onto the dairy and somebody wants to take this thing over. That is just a pleasure. And so I really want to encourage everybody to try to get to that point. So. You don't want to make big decisions when, when um, tragedy strikes. And in 2002, we had already sat down with a financial planner. And as, as I was back on the dairy now, seven years into the dairy farming, I got to ask him, who's a good attorney? And everybody said, use Bob Berry from Critchfield Firm. And I said, you mean Bob Berry, my old fraternity buddy from up there at Wadsworth? And they said, yeah, he's really good. So got a hold of Bob and, and uh, we sat down and he put together a real in, dump, real in depth for the time succession plan. And in the succession plan we addressed death and buyout at death and we addressed partners, we addressed how long the young guy had to work before he could come into the business. 
on our particular farm, it's at least three years, and that doesn't mean they get to come in after three years. They have to be brought in. My uncles, I had an uncle who was a silent partner back then who gifted some to us. So when it was all said and done, when I came in in 2002 with my brother Eric, Eric and I um, had a percentage of the farm. My dad had a percentage, and my uncle John had a percentage. When dad passed away, according to the succession plan then, and through working through my, with my other brothers who weren't on the farm and with my family, Eric and I then became 54% owners of the family, and my uncle John is 46% owner. And so my brother and I, at that time then, we uh, own the majority of the farm, and my uncle John, who's a super uncle, very f uh, fun man to work with, um, owned 46%. John, uh, John fed the cows. John's family is not involved in the dairy. John was our feeder for a lot of years. And Uncle John, unfortunately, and about six years ago, five, six years ago, one morning when he was preparing to go for a, on a trip, John had a stroke. And for a year, he was off the dairy until he recovered enough to come back. He was back for a, few, for a little bit of time, and then John had a heart procedure that was done. And when Uncle John had his heart procedure, he never really has worked back on the dairy. He comes around to see us, but he's really now a silent partner. And I, think, I hope that I worded that correctly, but I think I did. So he's still on the dairy. So Eric and I have been working for the last year or so. John had, John had some entities that were on the dairy. John had a house on the dairy. He has, a few years before I'd moved to town, but he had a house that was on the dairy. We have Steinhurst Dairy, which is our dairy part, and we have the land, 700 acres of land that we own. Because all those are big things, we decided that we were going to um, first tackle the house. And so my son Christian decided he wanted to get out of the house, so he bought the house. And in this last year, we've been talking with John about what his value of the dairy is, and we were looking, for, we've been looking forward to all this coming to my brother and I. Bear with me. Last month, on August 16th, this happened to my brother. My brother was, um, my brother had prostate cancer. He had some blood issues <clears throat> and uh, in partnerships, you farm 27 years with somebody, it can hurt. I wrote this about my brother for a Facebook post because people wanted to know what happened. Eric had prostate cancer and Eric was getting ready to go have surgery one morning. He came, one of the rules that our wives had at our place was we weren't allowed to wash our clothes in the washer and dryer in the house, the barn clothes. I didn't understand why. We used to have to take our clothes to the barn. <laughs> we took them to the barn and washed them. And Eric was getting his clothes the morning he left for surgery. And he got his clothes, and he was walking out the front door. I said, hey. He turned around. I said, Eric, I love you. I said, I love you. Don't worry about coming back. We'll take care of it. I was talking the four to eight weeks recovery time from the prostate surgery. He came home from surgery. He was home for a few days. And one night the squad showed up. <coughs> Something had happened. And he had, went under full cardiac arrest with a blood clot. He was in the hospital for a few days. And his wife, Tricia, had to make the decision to take him off life support. You know, I've been through this with my, with my dad. You know, I came back 27 years ago to farm with my dad, my uncle, and my brother, and none of them got to walk off the dairy the way we envisioned they would walk off the dairy. Go get parts for us, do things like that, just come ride along, things like that. But I'm going to tell you guys, you're not going to be here forever, and you better have it together when it comes to succession planning. The only thing that's really going to drive a true succession plan is communication. And if you can't communicate, you better start there. There's hope for our dairy, even though it's 650 cows and 700 acres. 
I said the other, I quit home and her that night because I had to meet with my sister-in-law. I had to meet with Eric's wife. And we're going to get it done. I don't even know exactly how. There's a verse in Psalms, one of the Psalms that talks about, I wish I had it. I was looking at it this morning. <clears throat> but it talks basically about not knowing where your workers are going to come from, but rely on the Lord. And I guess that's what we're going to do. But Eric was a, Eric was one of, just like my dad. I was the more outspoken one, and Eric was a worker. And uh, these kind of guys are invaluable on a dairy farm. And uh, so now, as we come down the home stretch, my son Christian on the left, that's the guy that was in the video earlier. He decided he's going to grow a beard. <laughs> but he's on the dairy, and he's an excellent asset to the dairy. He works with the cows now. I moved over to doing the feeding right now. Our daughter in the back is a freshman at law. She worked for in industry, the ag industry, for quite a few years, and now she's a freshman in law school at uh, Liberty College in Virginia. And ironically, she's always wanted to be a lawyer, and she's always wanted to do succession planning. She's always wanted to do it in agriculture. And uh, that's what she studied. Her undergraduate degree was in, in uh, agriculture. And our son in the front is a, in his master's program at Ohio State, and he uh, loves the dairy. He wanted to do what I did. He wants to work away first, and maybe God has other plans for that. We don't know. We're not going to make any big decisions until he graduates and see what happens. But uh, so that's where we're at. So I uh, just can't tell you enough the importance of having succession planning. You know, it's tough stuff. It's, it's tough to plod through. It's not fun. But uh, you go home tonight and you see your partners. I don't know why I told him I loved him. It's the only time I ever told him I loved him. But I told him I loved him the day he walked off the farm, and I'm at peace with it. So with that, that's our dairy. And I'll entertain any questions, if you would have any. question for you is when you go to have the conversation with for example like my husband's family we will eventually buy out the dairy farm um, my husband's lenient about talking to his parents about you know the planning of that if something were to happen to his parents how would you say about to go about addressing that conversation like where would you start with that <laughs> you know um, I know that all families are different, and I'm not going to tell you that it's been easy on our farm to do, to do all this. The talk I just gave resonates with the women in the crowd, because the women in the crowd know that their husbands aren't going to live forever, and they know that it's a side of them that they don't ever want to talk about. And so... It has to start with some sort of communication, and if they're willing to talk about it. Um, fortunately, we believe in sweat equity at our place. And there comes a point, if you've earned the right, if you've done it correctly, and you've earned the respect of the older generation, there comes a time when they're ready, they're, they know that that conversation's coming. It's just, a lot of times, they don't want to bring it up. There's two things they have to face. They have to face the reality that their kids might be able to do it, and that scares them. And also, then, they're getting older. You know, I'm 56 years old. After all this stuff we've done and all these things I have to do, I also got to make sure that we got it ducks in a row for who's coming next. You know, we've used massive life insurance policies. Um... When my father died, 2009, that was a tough dairy year. And we had a pretty good-sized life insurance policy on my father. I had a good life insurance policy on Eric. It wasn't millions of dollars. It wasn't a million dollars. But it was a nice policy. I was able to give, or I will be able here soon, to give his widow a nice amount of money 
up front here, and then we can figure out what else has got to come. But at least I can show a good faith effort. That policy was not expensive at all for Eric. Uncle John, we have a life insurance policy on him that's a little bit, maybe you could say it costs a little more, but it's for a long period of time. And so we don't wish death on anybody. But if one of you figures out how to not die, you got something going. <laughs> and so that's what's happened, you know, it, and so in our industry right now, that's about the best way to handle it. So if you've earned the respect, you know, I, we uh, know somebody in Ohio who, who uh, struggling with a, with a father situation. Maybe they haven't been there quite long enough. You know, it was seven years till I was able to sit down with my uncles and get this put together. And they were so willing to do it. But after seven years, we had proven that we want to be there. One thing we will have in the thing coming forward is um, I have no desire to take over a major dairy and then turn around a few years later and sell it. That's not my intent. And it's okay to have something in a buy-sell agreement that says, you know what, for the next five years, as long as this thing's in a dairy, this is the price. But if you can't make it in a couple years and you have to sell out, then your partner gets X amount more because you benefited from, from the sale of the dairy. So there's a lot of things you can do with good, good financial consultants. But, but you, you can't just b go into a conversation like that some night after there's been maybe a little riff or something. That ain't going to work. <laughs>